Hey, what is up, everybody? Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you guys know me, probably. I'm Andrew Cady. I run the Epic Mortgage Team, powered by You Mortgage. Uh, I know we have a lot of people from around the country, uh, different states, jumping in here. I'm here with Grant Daughtry. Uh, he is the founder CEO of Daughtry Tax Solutions, based out of Texas, works in all 50 states. Uh, if you don't follow Grant, Daughtry Tax Solutions, correct, on Instagram? If you don't follow him on yeah. Instagram, you definitely need to. He's got, I think, 70-some thousand followers or close to that number. And that's where I originally found Grant at. And I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many how many of his posts I've screenshotted and sent to my financial advisor. And I'm like, dude, you've got to check this out. We've got to implement this. It's consistently filled up with really, really, really amazing tax tips that are just put very much how I do my presentations in the layman's terms. Oftentimes you'll find people, you know, CPAs, whatever they are, everything becomes so mumbo jumbo and all these professional terms come out. Grant always seems like he has the ability to bring it down to the human side to, you know, me who's, you know, super stupid. If I can understand his post, I'm sure you can. So I'll turn it over to Grant. He's gonna kind of walk through some top tax secrets geared especially towards the real estate agent business because that's primarily who's going to be on this presentation awesome thank you for having me andrew and I, it, it's a real pleasure um and, and yeah I, you know one thing about it is i love to talk taxes i you know most people probably don't really like taxes too much but for some reason you know i just really found a liking to it uh and also y'all i'm a very interactive uh presenter so as I'm going through, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the question box, and hopefully I can answer them for you, and uh, you know, hopefully get you guys, uh, you know, sorted out and, and on the right direction. But yeah, if you guys ever want to check out my personal uh, Instagram page, it is Doherty Tax Solutions, uh, and if you ever want to follow me, I mispronounced your last name. <laughs> You're good, man. You're good. My bad. You're not the first, and you won't be the last, man. You know, so it's one of those things that I just take it off the, you know, I just, I just roll with the punches, right? So it's, it's. it's <laughs> The, the the point got across right you know so I, I don't take it personally but yeah if you guys ever want to follow me uh, on instagram that is my largest platform but uh, if you want to get even more in depth into like what my brain is thinking you can follow me on twitter because everything that I goes on my instagram goes on my twitter first and not everything that i put on twitter actually makes it to instagram so my instagram may actually be missing out on some stuff so yeah that's just one thing but before yeah let's just dive right into it Again, this is going to be a very uh, straightforward presentation. Uh, I'll just try to keep it, you know, short, simple, to the point. And uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to, to just, you know, chime in. But anyway, I am Grant Doherty. Uh, I am based out of Houston, Texas. I do own my company, uh, Doherty Tax Solutions. Uh, I actually went to Prairie View A&M University, where I studied. Um, uh, I studied business. I minored in finance and accounting. I actually got an MBA. In 2017, I'm also a student athlete, so I uh, I played baseball back when I was in college. So that was a while ago. I, I stopped. Uh, I, I my senior year was 2015, so now it's 2023. So that was nearly eight years ago. So uh, don't expect me to do too much uh, athletic skills, but that is how I got myself through school. is pretty is pretty cool. I was able to get out with any uh, without any student debt. I then got my enrolled agent license in 2021. Uh, that is essentially uh, my federal license that allows me to file taxes in all 50 states. Um, and so I also got married in 2019. I have uh, one son and one girl currently. And so uh, let's just kind of just dive right into it, right? You know, why, why taxes? Uh, it's very important to understand taxes because the average taxpayer, and this, this, these are just rough stats, right? You know, th these things change with inflation and all sorts of other, you know, different uh, things that can kind of go on. But the average taxpayer will pay around half a million dollars in their lifetime. That is a lot of money, especially if you are able to invest that, that half million somewhere else, you know, with, with the return on investment and, and different things like that. That half million that you spend on taxes could easily be a million or more. So, you know, here's just a few stats uh, added to it, right? You know, the average uh, federal tax rate is roughly 15%. However, that's just federal tax. That doesn't include state tax, and it doesn't include Social Security and Medicare, which if you combine uh, Social Security and Medicare along with the federal tax rate for, you know, the average person will spend between 22 and 30% 
uh, you know, that is like their average tax rate. It's going to be between 22 and 30 percent. Of course, some people fall over that. Some people fall below it. This is just very average. Uh, and also, one thing that we kind of joke about in the tax industry is if you're single and you make $100,000 in a year, you can expect that the first four months of the year that you work, basically all that money is going to go towards taxes. So currently, it's only February. Every day that you have worked this year, that money is going towards taxes. It's not even really going towards your bottom line, essentially. So, um, and it's going to be the largest expense for many Americans. You know, your tax liability uh, is going to be over time. It is going to be your largest expense, along with living expenses and a few other things. Medical expenses will also run up there, but you know, you should only really have to worry about your living and your medical. You know, the taxes is, is one of those things that you can actually help mitigate. So uh, get with a, a tax professional or, uh, you know, if you have the wherewithal, you know, try to tackle this situation on your own. And, uh, you know, you can really see a large return on investment. Now, this, this, uh, this, this topic, uh, this presentation, I was told to gear mostly towards realtors and different real estate agents. So that's kind of like where we're going to kind of, you know, go along with this presentation. Now, most realtors are going to be 1099 contractors. They're going to be self-employed, okay? And the tax code actually treats the self-employed very similar to business owners. And that means that you are allowed to write off certain expenses against your income. So if you go out and you make $100,000, well, if you incur thirty or forty thousand dollars of expenses that that you had to, you had to essentially incur this to make a profit, you can deduct that from your income and you can only pay taxes on either the sixty or the seventy thousand. You know, just just as a quick example. Now uh, most people, most self employed individuals will put their income on a schedule C. Uh, now if you ever decide to elect to be taxed differently, maybe you're in a partnership or maybe you're in an S corporation, you know, we'll kind of talk a little bit about S corps here in a little bit, but that'll be a little bit different of a tax form that you'll fill out there. But most people who are self employed, you'll just fill out a schedule C. And also the big bummer that a lot of people need to look out for is actually self-employment tax. For self-employed individuals, <clears throat> that tax, it's a combination of both Social Security and Medicare, and it comes out to 15.3%. So before you pay any type of federal tax or state tax, and you're self-employed right off the top, you're paying 15.3% just to self-employment taxes. If you are, the way how that 15.3 is, is, is broken down, Half is owed by the employer and half is owed by the employee. However, if you are self-employed, you play both roles. So from a lot of W-2 individuals, you know, if, you, if you go to work and you're an employee, you receive a W-2, you do kind of come out on top in regards to the self-employment tax because you only have to pay half of that. Uh, but you also don't really get to write off as many expenses that, uh, that you incur with your income. So that's kind of the drawback to being a W-2 employee. <clears throat> However, we can talk a little bit more about that. And here's kind of like that breakdown that I talked about with self-employment taxes. Again, it's 15.3% total. But as you can see, um, half is owed by the employer, half is owed by the employee. Uh, and if you want to break it down even further, 12.4% is actually goes straight to Social Security, and 2.9% goes to Medicare. Now, one thing that you really should keep in mind, and this really plays a, a big role whenever you start looking at, oh, should I be taxed as an S-Corp or, or anything like that, you'll want to look at the Social Security wage base, which for 2023 is $160,200. And essentially what happens whenever you reach this Social Security wage base they no longer charge the 12.4% Social Security tax on your earnings. So it's 15.3% all the way up to $160,200. And once when you make over that, Social Security, the 12.4 goes away. And the 2.9% Medicare tax, that still stays, but they actually add an additional 0.9% uh, additional Medicare tax on that. So now you're paying 3.8%. Um, uh, Medicare tax on any earnings over that Social Security wage base. Again, that's a very important uh, thing to keep in mind whenever you start looking at things like S corporations, because what the whole goal of being taxed as an S corp is to mitigate 
or reduce the amount of self-employment taxes that you would essentially be paying. However, once we're getting close to that Social Security wage base, now the benefit, you know, really drops from like, okay, I was avoiding 15.3% of this tax, and now I'm only avoiding like around 4%. So again, it, 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 the strategicness of, of the S-Corp can change depending on what your income is. Now, one of the biggest things that I always tell people is, you know, you're going to want to, you're going to want to, you know, if you can avoid the Social Security and Medicare taxes, remember, avoiding taxes is perfectly illegal. Whenever you start to evade and you're actually doing things that are illegal, that is not okay. But if you, you know, if you use the law to avoid certain uh, taxes, that is perfectly okay. And some of the ways that you can do that, of course, you know, I have my, F, I have the S Corporation election down there, but, uh, you know, especially for real estate agents, you know, you should really look into investing into real estate because as we're going to get into here in just a little bit, there's a lot of uh, incentives that real estate agents can capture a lot easier than they would if they were just like a W-2. But investing in real estate uh, is also a great way to avoid Social Security and Medicare taxes. The way how our uh, tax system is set up, they have passive income and we also have active income. The active income is going to be subject to Social Security and Medicare. A lot of people uh, refer to those taxes as like the working man or the working woman's tax, okay? You go out, you earn this income, you have to pay Social Security and Medicare, which, you know, and, and let, let's step back a little bit. In hindsight, it's not a terrible thing to be paying these taxes, right? Because that is what essentially funds uh, your Social Security. Whenever you go to retire, if you are planning on having any type of Social Security income coming from that, you will, you will have wanted to be paying these taxes over the years. So I do have a, a few circumstances where I actually advise people who are getting close to retirement, hey, let's actually find some ways to actually pay these taxes so that you can qualify for Social Security whenever you decide to retire. But, uh, you know, if you have a long, uh, you know, future ahead of you, you may want to start finding ways to change that income from active over to passive. So it's passive income is not subject to Social Security and Medicare. And all rental income naturally is going to be considered passive. Uh, so that is a, a really big, um, you know, incentive that I tell a lot of people to look at is, you know, change your income from active over to passive. In the long term, you'll really thank yourself. Now, what are some deductible expenses for uh, real estate agents or just, you know, self-employed and business owners in general? Now, up here at the top, I kind of have what the IRS, uh, you know, classifies as a business expense. It has to meet the ordinary, necessary, and reasonable test. Do other people in your in industry ordinarily incur these expenses? Uh, is this expense necessary for you to incur to make a profit? And is it reasonable, right? Are there other people in your industry spending the same type of expenses that you are? That's essentially what it kind of boils down to. But very quickly, you know, you can get uh, vehicle expenses, software subscriptions, equipment, professional fees, educational material, home office expenses. Those are a, a quick list of the things that you can that you can deduct on your tax return. And one thing I always tell people, you know, whether you are a self-employed individual, you own a business, or maybe you invest in real estate, is get good bookkeeping. You can't build a good house without a strong foundation. And whenever you are self-employed, whenever you own real estate, bookkeeping is going to be your foundation. So you want to make sure your foundation is strong before you decide to go and build a house, okay? To dive a little bit further into the home office expense, essentially what it is, is if you use a portion of your home, uh, you know, exclusively and regularly for your business, then you do you can take a deduction for it. Now there are two ways how you can claim this expense. Uh, there's the standard method, which will probably be the, the, the most straightforward and simple way to do it. You would just take the total square footage of your um, office space and you would multiply it by five dollars, and boom, that's your deduction. Okay, very simple, very straightforward. However, if you have a lot of expenses that you incur with your home office, you may want to look at the actual method because then what the way how the actual method works is you take the same square footage of your home office and now you divide by your entire living space, the square footage of your entire living space, whether it be your home or whether it be your apartment that you rent out. You can claim this expense whether you own or whether you rent. 
And then you'll go in and you can deduct things like real estate taxes, mortgage interest, Wi-Fi. If you rent, you can deduct a part of your rent, utilities, AC and heat, and trash. Those are just a few things that you can deduct. That is taken on um, your Schedule C if you want to do the standard method or it's done on Form 8829 if you take the actual method, okay? Now, another one that I talked about was vehicle expenses. Now, one thing that I always tell people is there's a few deductions that the IRS will scrutinize a little bit more than other expenses. One of them is going to be vehicle expenses. The other ones are going to be meals and also travel. For some reason, these expenses or these categories are always the most commonly abused. So the IRS requires a little bit more documentation. If you ever find yourself in an audit, the IRS will require a little bit more documentation for you to validate that expense. So I always recommend that you download an app to track your miles. You'll want to track both business and personal miles so you can get uh, an overall uh, you know, business usage of your vehicle. I recommend, you know, Mile IQ is a really good one. Trip Log is also a really good one. But if you already use QuickBooks, uh, you know, you can use QuickBooks as well. QuickBooks has a little, a little app. And, you know, QuickBooks is probably the most commonly used bookkeeping software for all self-employed individuals. So I definitely recommend getting one of these apps. Now, for the first, uh, for 2023, uh, they raised the standard method. Uh, oh, let me back up. So there are two ways how you can claim the vehicle expenses. Again, you have the standard method and you have the actual method, just like you do with the home office expense. For the standard method, you take the total business miles that you drove and you multiply by a set standard rate. For 2023, it is 65.5 cents per business mile that you drive. Very simple to calculate if you drove X amount of miles, you multiply that X by your uh, 65 and a half cents per mile, and boom, that is your deduction. Now, you can also take the actual method. The actual uh, method will require you to track both business and personal, and then you divide the two, and now you have a business use percentage. And that percentage will apply to all of your expenses, things like uh, gas, tire changes, oil changes, any type of repairs, maybe you got a crack in the window, car washes, all those will apply through the actual method. The, the big one though, is gonna be depreciation. So you can claim depreciation on a business vehicle if you are using it for business. However, what a lot of people like to try to chase after is the section 179 expense. That only applies to business vehicles that weigh over 6,000 pounds. And one thing I always tell people is if you are chasing that deduction, you cannot take the section 179 unless you use a vehicle over 50% of the time for business usage. So that's one thing I always tell people uh, whenever they're looking at that deduction for like a, a uh, business vehicle or something. And also one thing that everyone should be taking care of, not just self-employed individuals, but W-2 individuals as well, sorry about that, um, is your retirement plan. You know, you should be investing in your future. We have no idea what the future holds, so you might as well go ahead and start preparing for it now in, in, in the event of whatever happens. I recommend a solo 401k. That is my favorite type of retirement plan for self-employed individuals. The reason being, um, you know, I, I tell people that self-employed retirement accounts are like regular accounts on steroids, okay? Solo 401ks and SEP IRAs have a $66,000 contribution limit for 2023, which is pretty remarkable, um, but you can actually get to that $66,000 much quicker with a solo 401k versus a SEP IRA. I also talked a little bit about Roth IRAs, and uh, you can also do a simple IRA. Those are a little bit different. They do not have the $66,000 contribution limit, uh, but I always recommend people fund a Roth IRA. The, really the biggest reason, okay, yeah, you, you can create your own bucket of tax-free income now, but for generational wealth building purposes, you can actually – let's just say you do really well in your life and you never actually need to touch your Roth IRA. You can just let it sit there and it's just this tax-free bucket of income uh, that you don't even need. Well, if you have any children or any type of heirs, you can actually pass that Roth IRA down to them after you pass away. 
and they can receive the same tax benefits that you would have received. So for generational wealth building purposes, there's like few tools out there that are better than the Roth IRA. They can avoid probate fees. They, you know, there's a lot of powerful tools that go into the Roth IRA. And if you cannot directly contribute to a Roth IRA, I recommend looking into a backdoor Roth IRA. Okay, there's a few caveats that go into the backdoor Roth. So get with the financial advisor and get with the tax advisor to make sure you're doing that correctly. Now, one of the things, this is like my favorite topic. And that's going to be investing in real estate, okay? The reason why is passive by nature, okay? So one of the cool things about having passive income, it's not subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes. So if you can take your earned income and funnel it over to a passive source and build up your passive source, eventually whenever you decide to walk away from your job, uh, you know, it's a great way of replacing the income while still paying less in taxes. So, you know, I always, you know, show people if you had $100,000, of, of income as a self-employed individual versus $100,000 of rental income, you will pay less in taxes on the $100,000 of rental income. And that's after all expenses have been accounted for, right? You know, you, you've gone through, you've taken your depreciation, you've done your retirement plan, you've done everything, and now you're at 100K for each. The, the 100K in rental income will be taxed far less than any type of, of earned income. And that's really mostly going to be because of self-employment taxes, okay? Not only that, but uh, real estate, you know, is also subject to capital gains. So if you were to sell an asset, uh, it is taxed more favorably, especially if you held it for the long term. You know, you now you have long-term capital gains. That is taxed far more favorably than earned income. And then, uh, so one thing we talked about earlier was the S-Corps. S-Corp is a great way for... Uh, you to avoid Social Security and Medicare taxes. However, if you have rental property and, you know, you're receiving rental income, you would almost never want to have a S-Corp holding those properties for the, for the big reason, right? The whole reason of, of you going to be taxed as an S-Corp is to avoid Social Security and Medicare. However, rental income is passive and it isn't even subject to those taxes anyway. So, you know, essentially, you're doing all this extra work for no real benefit. And in fact, if you have an S-Corp, you are required to pay yourself a W-2, which is subject to those taxes. So you could actually, actually, in the long term, what you could do is you could take rental income that's not subject to Social Security and Medicare, and you could have it in an S-Corp. And now you're forced to essentially require yourself to pay a W-2. So now you take income that wasn't subject to those taxes, and now you're paying taxes on it anyway. So no escorts for owning rental real estate. Maybe if you're doing a fix and flip, or maybe if you uh, like own a property and you use it very similar to like a hotel, you, you provide what's known as substantial services. Then maybe you could look at, at being taxed as an escort. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so now, uh, Shelton is asking, um, per the IRS, how do they define passive income? What's the definition of passive income? Oh, I mean, that's a really good question. I have to go back and pull up what the actual, uh, you know, what the actual definition of that is. But for tax purposes, passive income is not going to be subject to uh, Social Security and Medicare. So think of things like rental income. Rental income would be considered passive. Technically, even capital gains would be considered passive because it's also not subject to the Social Security and Medicare, although it would be it would be taxed slightly different. It's taxed at the capital gains level. So think of anything that you are earning income and uh, where, where you have income coming in, but you did not go out and actually earn it. Think of things like dividends, rental income, um, uh, capital gains, different things like that would be considered passive. But if you go out and you earn it via uh, self-employment or you have a W-2, that is now earned income. Does that answer? I hope that answers his question. Yeah, it, it makes sense. It's just the difference of, of you're actively earning the income by working in that profession. For instance, you may have right. ownership in a company that you don't work at. Any gains from that company would be considered passive gains because you're no, you're, you're not, you, you don't work there. You're not doing anything to earn it. You simply own shares of a company. Correct. Correct. That is correct. All right. Now, that's right, a really good question. It. And again, y'all feel free to shoot them out as, as, as you get these questions come along. Uh, are there any others? Yeah, um, Jessica's asking, she says, I do a ton of television and radio ads for my real estate business. 
Can that be a tax write-off, the cost of doing television and radio ads and even the equipment associated with producing it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's an advertising expense if I've ever heard one. But, yeah, those, that can all be deducted. Uh, and, and, yeah, that, that is an, uh, a qualified expense. So that's a really good question. All right, well, guys, keep the questions coming. We'll, we'll kind of interrupt and, and drop them in as we go so we don't have to do a big Q&A. If you have a question, we want to get it answered. If you have to hop off early or something, we don't want you to miss your answer. So we'll drop them in here as we get them. Right, right, right. right. No, most definitely, most definitely. Okay, uh, kind of like jumping right back into it. So one of the things I commonly get, get asked about is like, okay, I want to buy these rental properties, but I want to use the depreciation from these rental properties to offset my income like how can i do that well there's a few ways how you can do that um so starting out very the, the most simple one would be the mom and pop loophole uh, essentially what it is if you have modified adjusted gross income that is under a hundred thousand dollars i'll get to this 150 here in a second but if you have modified adjusted gross income below a hundred thousand dollars you can use up to twenty five thousand dollars of passive losses to offset your earned income. Now, once when you make over $100,000 of modified adjusted gross income, for every $2 you make over $100,000, you lose $1 of that $25,000 deduction. So by the time you reach $150,000 of modified adjusted gross income, your $25,000 uh, deduction is completely phased out, okay? And essentially to meet the mom and pop loophole, it's a very easy uh, requirement. All you'd have to do is just actively participate in your property. If you ever wanted to discuss what active participation is, probably get with a, a tax advisor because there's a few caveats to it, but uh, it's much easier than what we're going to talk about here in a second is materially participating in your properties. There's a few more uh, requirements whenever you get to material participation. Now, the other ways are you can qualify as a real, for real estate professional status. And for a lot of self-employed realtors, real estate professional status is actually something that they can look into because uh, essentially what it is is to be considered a real estate professional. You don't need any licenses or anything like that. It's all based on strictly what you individually do for your rental activities. There's a few tests to meet it. So the first one is you spend 750 hours in a real property trade or business. If you are a 1099 realtor and you are out there, uh, you know, you know, trying to sell out all these different homes. That is considered a real property trade or business. So all the time you spend on your real estate agent work, those hours qualify for real estate professional status. They qualify towards that 750 hours. Now the thing that gets a lot of people caught up is that the second part to that is that you have to spend over half of your personal services that you render in a year in a real property trade or business. Again, for a real estate agent to strictly only do realtor activity, that wouldn't be much of a problem. The problem comes in whenever you have someone who has a W-2 and they're like, oh, I own 20 rental properties, so I'm also a property manager. That's kind of like where they would probably get caught up because they probably still spend more time at the W-2 than they do on their property management. So like that's kind of like the, the, the big caveat with that test. But for a lot of real estate agents who are, especially if you're 1099, if you're a real estate agent and you're W-2, you have to own over 5% of the business that you work for in, out, in order for your hours to qualify. So that's one little caveat there. But uh, the workaround to real estate professional status is to invest in short-term rentals. Uh, and the reason being, uh, the IRS has a little code in there, and it's, it's really meant for uh, the hotel industry. Uh, but, you know, with the rise of Airbnb and VRBO, a lot of real estate investors have been using this with short-term rentals. And essentially what it says is that if the average tenant stays for seven days or less, you don't actually have a quote unquote rental activity under section 469. So you don't actually have to meet real estate professional status in order to change the, the income from passive over to active. You would just have to materially participate in your short term rental. Okay. And so that's, that's really uh, what I work a lot. Uh, when I work with a lot of different real estate investors, I get asked a lot about short term rentals and it's a very lucrative strategy. 
so yeah, that that's definitely one of the ones that that, uh, that I work with a lot of people on. Here's here's uh, our, our my little um, uh, slide on real estate professional status. Again, you have to spend 750 hours in a real property trade or business in which you materially participate. Again, this is very ideal for real estate agents because as you are going out and you're showing different clients properties and you're closing on properties, those hours that you are spending is in a real property trade or business. So you're all, you know, the work you're already doing is basically you're, you're putting yourself halfway there. Again, the this, this second part is more than half of the personal services you render must be in a real property trade or business. So this only really becomes a problem if you have a second job outside of, of your real estate agent uh, work, okay? Now, the other part is that you must materially participate in your rentals. So you must spend 750 hours in a real property trade or business in which you materially participate. That is one part. Outside of that, you then need to materially participate in your rentals. And there are seven tests to material participation, but three of them are going to be more commonly used than most uh, than most of the other tests. The other tests require you to have uh, previous years uh, of, of participation already met. So for most people just getting involved, it's going to be these three most common tests. Okay, the 500-hour test is going to be uh, considered the gold standard because one thing about uh, taxes, right? It's especially once when you really know how to fill out the different forms and, 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 and you just learn the software, uh, you know, like myself, I could put whatever I wanted on a tax return and get it to show basically whatever I wanted, okay? But that's not the, the, the tricky part. The tricky part is validating what I put on that tax return. And that's where a lot of people get caught up in these different material participation tests because you have to track your time. And Whenever I get into like administrative tasks, administratively, this 500 hour test would be the easiest because you would only have to track your time if you did that. Whenever it comes down to the more than 100 hour test and the substantially all test, not only do you have to track your time, but now you have to track everyone else that ever worked in that property. You have to track their time as well. So administratively, it becomes a lot more difficult to kind of treat, you know, keep track of everything. Now, I do tell people that there are ways around it, you know, especially if you have, like, cameras at your rental property. You can go back and you can pull the cameras and you can start, you know, finding the different people that worked at the property and you can pick apart the time and that's how you can download uh, and you can track their time. Uh, but it's best if you can go ahead and, and track all their time as it's happening and that you don't have to go back and try to find it because you can recreate your, your time logs, however, that can be very, very difficult unless you have something like a camera there watching all of your, uh, you know, your activity at the property. And again, you only need to meet one of the seven tests for material participation in order to qualify. And one of the best things uh, about, you know, the tax code is really, they say the tax code is like a, a um, like it, it's like a behavior incentive, right? If they put certain things in the tax codes because that's what they want you to do. And, you know, far above and, you know, commonly, I keep running across, Mary Filing Journey is by far like the best or one of the best filing statuses that you can uh, file as. And so one of the big perks, especially for material participation, is that spouses can combine their time for purposes of material participation. So uh, if, if maybe you're a real estate agent that is just absolutely crushing it, right? You could go and meet the reps test for 750 hours and, and you're materially participating in your real estate agent activity. And if you have a spouse, your spouse could be managing the rental properties. And then you guys can combine the material participation and that's how y'all can qualify, uh, you know, if you have a situation like that. So that's, a, that's another plan that I commonly uh, work on individuals with is, okay, we have spouses. Let's uh, have one spouse go and, and meet reps and then have the other spouse go and manage the property. And now we can combine the time for them to meet real estate professional status and they can offset some income. So that, that's just like, a, you know, some of the things that we talk about in regards to material participation. And I may have already covered this a little bit with short-term rentals. Uh, again, if the average stay for a tenant at your property is less than seven days, then the activity is not considered a rental activity under section 469. And because it's not considered a rental activity, you don't even have to meet real estate professional status. All you have to do is materially participate. 
and you can treat the property as non-passive, okay? Now, one thing that I do tell people, and this is one of those things that can easily slip someone's mind, okay? Depreciation, that's gonna be one of your largest expenses that you claim, uh, and so it's very important to understand how to calculate depreciation on a rental property. Residential properties are depreciated at, at 27 and a half years, and uh, commercial properties, are treated, uh, they're depreciated at 39 years. However, whenever you're looking at short-term rentals, all short-term rentals are going to be treated as non-residential property, which means they fall into that, uh, that commercial property classification. So even if you have a home that is in a residential neighborhood, if you use it and the average tenant stays for seven days or less, you do not depreciate that property at 27 and a half years. You depreciate it at 39 years. However, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's, there are some benefits that apply only to 39 year property that does not apply to 27 and a half year property. So it's not, uh, all, you know, it's, it's not just all ends and, you know, it's just bad that, that short term rental is depreciated 39 years. There are some, uh, some incentives that, that they do, uh, that they can claim. Okay, but that is just one thing that, that I, I commonly see, uh, you know, messed up whenever people go to calculate uh, their depreciation. Now, here's a little bit, here's my slide on depreciation. The one that I want y'all to really focus on are the last two, okay? Accelerated depreciation strategies with cost segregation, okay? Cost segregation, essentially what it is, is let's say you go and you buy a rental property. Whenever you buy a rental property, not only are you buying the building, but you're buying the land. And you're also buying, if there's a parking garage, if there is a sidewalk, if there is a parking lot, if there is an oven, microwave, all these different things, curtains, furniture, all of those, all these different items are depreciated much quicker than 27 and a half or 39 years. And so whenever you do a cost aggregation analysis, you just get some engineers to come out and look at your property and they say, oh, this $100,000 building is actually made up of $30,000 of sidewalks, parking, uh, parking lots, uh, curtains, furniture, different things like that. And so uh, especially last year, whenever we had 100% bonus depreciation, you could fully depreciate anything that had a lifespan of 20 years or less immediately in the first year. This year we have 80% bonus depreciation, so it's still a big benefit, but every real estate investor should understand that they can accelerate depreciation with a cost segregation analysis. Now, how beneficial is that cost seg going to be? Always, always, always talk with your tax advisor so they can clearly outline what type of benefit you will be receiving because a lot of people try to get these cost eggs to immediately offset their income, and maybe they don't qualify. Maybe some of it actually gets postponed until the next year. So that is something that you will want to make sure that you clear up with your tax advisor. And also, any time that you are claiming depreciation on a property, you have to understand that whenever you go to sell that property, you will have depreciation recapture tax on that depreciation, okay? Make sure you claim the depreciation because if you don't claim it, whenever you go to sell that asset, the IRS will calculate it as if you claim depreciation regardless of whether you took it or not. So always, always, always claim depreciation and understand that you will have a depreciation recapture tax whenever that comes about. Okay. All right. And this so is Alex, the last Alex has a, go ahead. Alex has a question on this. Um, is there a price point of a property? where it makes sense to do a cost segregation study of like a value of a property due to the cost of a cost seg, you know, at some point, if you're doing a cost segregation study on a hundred thousand dollar home, is it even worth it? Or is there like a, a general price point where it begins to make sense? Man, that is a really good question. That's the type of question I really like to talk about. Okay. It depends. Okay. That is always going to be my answer. Now, there's, I'm going to give you guys a few general rules of thumb that you can use to, you know, going forward. If you have a property that is half a million dollars or less in value, I would probably recommend downloading some type of do-it-yourself software, DIY software. The reason being is that it's a fraction of the cost to, to, to essentially do your cost seg that way. Now, yeah, if you have a $100,000 home, you'd probably be trying to figure out, like, okay, how much is my cost seg going to be? This is what I tell people. 
and again, this is very, very rough general rules of thumb. There are different ways of going about doing this, but whenever you buy a property, roughly 20 to 40% of your purchase price will be reallocated to land. So if you have a $100,000 property, let's just say $150,000 property, you can expect about 50,000 of that 150,000 overall cost to be allocated towards land. You cannot depreciate land. So now you're left with a depreciable basis of $100,000. Okay, from that $100,000 depreciable basis, you can expect a cost seg to get you between 15 and 30% of that, of that depreciable basis reallocated. Again, it depends on what type of property you have. Maybe you have a condo and you only have five-year property. Maybe you have uh, like a mobile home uh, park and like 60% of, of your mobile home park can be reallocated. So again, it depends on what type of property, but roughly I would say between 15 and 30% of your depreciable basis can be reallocated to a uh, you know much quicker depreciated item. So then from there, what you can do is you can calculate what your actual deduction is going to be. And then you can start grabbing in your effective tax rate or maybe even your top marginal tax rate. And you can kind of then apply that to your overall deduction. And you can see like, okay, maybe a $20,000 deduction will save me $4,000 in taxes. So if I'm saving a total of $4,000 in taxes, let's apply that to all the work that I have to put into to go through this process, the amount of money that I'm spending to get it done. That's really the way how I like to break it down. Like I try to break it all the way down to what are your actual tax savings and how much are you expecting to pay for it and how much time and energy are you putting into it, right? Now Makes again, it, it, depends. it depends on every property. Uh, my general rule of thumb is, is that if it's half a million or less, you could probably just download a software and you can, you know, now you're dealing with a fraction of the cost of what it costs to go and hire someone. If you're dealing with something over a half million dollar property, you probably don't want to go and hire a specialist. And if you have over a half million dollar property, it probably would make sense from that perspective. Now, there are other factors you have to consider, right? Do I have other passive income that can uh, be offset by this cost seg? Am I am I materially participating or am I meeting reps? So this loss is not a non, it's not a passive loss. It's an actual, it's, it's a non-passive loss. So now it's offsetting my W-2 income. So there's a few factors that you would have to consider. It's not always, oh, I have a half million dollar property. I'm going to go get a cost seg. It's, it's not ever just that simple, but generally, and I just gave you, you know, rough rules of thumb. You can kind of like go through and, uh, you know, break down the numbers to kind of see what your benefit would actually be. Cool stuff. All right, all right. And then this last slide, this is this is just uh, you know some other real estate tax incentives. Uh, you can do 1031 exchanges, which is a great way to avoid uh, any type of capital gains tax you may have on a substantially appreciated property. Uh, you can also invest in opportunity zones. Uh, one thing I see commonly messed up is make sure you get an opportunity fund first. Okay, that's very very important. You cannot invest in an opportunity zone unless you do it through an opportunity fund first. Okay, and then the step up in basis is always a big one. Essentially what that is, is whenever you buy a property, your basis is what your investment is. So let's just say you buy a property at $100,000. And then, I don't know, 50, 60 years goes by, uh, you are getting ready to pass, but your property is now worth a million dollars. You could sell that property and you would have a $1 million minus $100,000 basis you'd be looking at a $900,000 uh, taxable event going into that. However, with the step up in basis, if you were to pass away and your property now goes to one of your heirs, your heirs would receive a step up in basis. And what that is, is that your basis was $100,000. However, whenever you pass, they, got, they get to step up their basis up to the fair market value, which in this case would be a million. So now they can either sell that property and now their capital gain is a million minus a million. It's going to be at almost zero. You know, of course, there's always fluctuations that kind of go into it. So maybe they have a very small tax bill. It's not the same as if they're paying taxes on $900,000 of capital gain. But you, you get the general idea. They get to step up that basis. And also one of the other benefits is that if they decide to turn it into a rental property, 
your depreciation is based on what your basis is in the property. So if they decide to turn it into a rental, now they get a, a much larger depreciation deduction versus if they were to try to use it at that $100,000 basis. But that is basically my presentation. It was, you know, relatively rough, very quick. Uh, I hope I, I hope I, you know, gave you guys some some good information. If y'all have any questions, feel free to shoot them out. You know, that's what uh, I think we're going to work on now. Yeah. So one question that's that popped up in here is is why airfare? What you know? What, why does the IRS scrutinize you know airfare like that type of stuff? And I can see it from a real estate. Like, sure, it's one thing if you're going to a real estate convention. Obviously documented, that is a travel expense for business. But what about someone who, say, invests in Airbnbs? And this is a conversation you and I, you and I had. You know, I, I, yeah. I invest in real estate, own real estate. Well, I'm going to, you know, go to Napa Valley with my wife and we're going to go hang out and we're going to look at real estate while we're there. You know, we're going to go to a few open houses each day we're there. And, you know, the, the purpose of the trip is really because we would like to own a home there. But at the same time, we're going to go to the vineyards and we're going to drink some wine and we're going to have some great dinners. Yeah. How do you expense a trip like that? What does that look like? Yeah, you know, so really the, the best way to do that is, you know, you want to go in, you want to partition. OK, what was what was business? What was personal? And then from there, you can kind of partition out. OK, this amount of my of my trip would be business deductible. And the other part, I'll just go have to foot. Now, there are ways how you can essentially it's called wrap a weekend where if you're doing business on that friday and then again you're doing business the following monday as long as you have business on both of those days then the weekend becomes business days whether you were actually spending business time uh whether you were engaged in business activities or not it just becomes deductible now if you took like a cruise you know or um, maybe not let's just say you took an excursion on like saturday the excursion cost would not be deductible but your meals and your hotel stay would essentially be considered business deductible because that is part of the business day. But yeah, your excursion to the vineyard, unfortunately, would not be deductible. But yeah, <laughs> okay, that is so, how you can so if I'm following you correctly, we just need to make sure we book business travel from like Thursday to Tuesday and not from like Saturday to Monday. Yeah, I wouldn't do it Saturday to Monday. The best way to do it if you're trying to get some personal time would be to try to wrap your weekend. So essentially work Thursday, Friday, maybe take Saturday and Sunday off, work again Monday, Tuesday, and then you're good to go. Like that would be that would be perfectly legitimate. Now, if you were not, you know, wrapping a weekend, then yeah, you would have to partition out how much of this was business, how much of this was personal. And the best way to do that it's just to get like an itinerary, track your time, document it. You know, it'd be like any other big corporate event where they, you know, they're they're hosting an event out in Napa Valley. They're gonna have an itinerary of what all is going on. You should do the same. Yeah. No, it makes sense. So I, I I don't see any other questions coming in. Only other one was, can we access this later? Someone had to bounce for a showing. Yeah, we'll we'll have a copy of the recording. I I can absolutely send that out. You know, talk about crazy valuable information. Obviously. If you guys have a tax professional, if they're not advising you at this level, maybe consider a phone call uh, to, to Mr. Grant yeah. because because honestly, like like that that's how I feel in the real estate environment. You know, I Grant, you should post it on Twitter Twitter sometime. Like I post once or twice a year. I say, you know, hey, if if my Facebook posts inform you more or make you laugh more congratulations, I am now your loan officer. You, you're not allowed to talk to your current loan officer anymore. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. But, you know, I say that jokingly, but I also don't. Like, if, if Grant's an expert in what he's doing, I mean, obviously you can just tell by the way he's rolling through this. He gets tax code the way I get the mortgage industry. So working with a professional can really change our, change our lives on things. And so I, I genuinely appreciate you taking the time to jump on here. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, so I think we'll we'll part it here. But you got any final parting words, Grant? No, I mean it was a real pleasure, Andrew. Uh, again, one thing I probably cannot stress enough, and and this goes for everything that I've told y'all as well, right? Any any time you hear uh, anything regarding tax law, like tax strategy, you should always go back and verify this information on irs.gov or with your tax advisor. All right. It's very easy to run across information that 
uh, is not always accurate and it's not always the person posting it, right? You know, tax laws can be very complex. It's very easy to leave something out, right? One of the things I run across all the time is actually if you use, so if you're going to get a short-term rental and you're going to fix it up, you're going to meet all these material participation hours, I don't know how many times I've run across, oh, man, I stayed at the property for an entire month. If you stay at a property for over 14 days, it now becomes a personal property, and you can't do things like cost segregation to really offset your income too far. So, like, that would be, you know, that's it. Well, I talked a lot about material participation, but I forgot to mention the 14-day rule, right? So there's a lot of caveats that kind of go into these things. So always, always, always double check with irs.gov or with your tax advisor to make sure that you get all the details that pertain to your specific situation. Yeah. And in other words, don't get your tax advice off TikTok. Most of it is inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. All right. Well, I, I think we'll call it a day there. I appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, we'll have a recording if anybody needs a copy. If you want to share it around your office, if you're looking for anything, hit us up. Uh, we're always available. And I appreciate the day, Grant. Thank you, guys. No, my pleasure. It's a pleasure, Andrew.